Network members. Anybody there? Oh, wow, this is amazing. Okay, what we're going to do, I think, is uh, say hello to everybody. Um, my name is Catherine Carlton, and I'm sitting here in the sumptuous basement uh, palatial offices of Orchestras Canada in Peterborough, Ontario, and I'm joined by... Sue Ditto. I'm the Executive Director of the Electric City Culture Council here in Peterborough, Ontario, and that is the city's official Arts, Culture, and Heritage Council. Oh my goodness, and uh, we're, just, here. we're just coming into one o'clock, and so this is exciting for us. Uh, Although uh, Sue and I are both quite active on Facebook on our own personal and organizational accounts, mm -hmm. this is our first Facebook Live, so we're pretty excited to be uh, part of this uh, glorious movement. And uh, welcome to everybody who's just coming on. We'll start in about a minute, just to give people time to uh, log on and, uh, and get going. But we promise a lively and interactive time. We've got a pretty strong agenda sorted out and uh, are pretty thrilled to be here uh, under the auspices of the wonderful people at Spark. So uh, welcome to everyone who's just coming on now and we'll get going in about a minute. Thanks so much. And uh, feel free, we do get to see who's joining us uh, in the comment box. And I'll stress that uh, writing your comments down uh, on the Facebook page will be a huge help to us as we want this to be as useful for you as it possibly can be. Obviously, we can't see you. We can only see each other in the wall behind us. So if our eyes keep drifting to the right, it's because we're watching for your names and your comments on the sidebar. Okay, so Sue, we're just at, at 101 right now. So I think what we'll, uh, we'll start out with uh, is our introductions, and I'm just wondering if you'd like to say a few words about yourself. Sue Ditta, Meet the World. Hi. Hi. I'm as I said, the Executive Director of the Electric City Culture Council. We're really fortunate in Peterborough, the City Council passed a municipal cultural plan in 2012, and its so-called signature recommendation was the creation of an Arts Council. I worked for, it's called the Electric City Culture Council, or EC3, and I worked for them as a consultant on and off for about two years, and more recently, about two years ago, because the council was formed in 2012, I came aboard as executive director, but I've been working in the arts for almost 40 years now, including at the National Gallery and the Canada Council for the Arts, and I have a private consulting practice, so I've... Um, worked all across Canada on governance and strategic planning and policy development, <clears throat> review and evaluation, and I've always had to do a lot of advocacy work, whether it was for the media arts section within the context of the Canada Council or here in Peterborough, where we're working really hard to provide um, better for support and infrastructures for individual artists and arts organizations. Fantastic. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> My name is Catherine Carlton. I'm Executive Director of Orchestras Canada, and I've been in this role since 2005. We are the National Association for Canadian Orchestras, and we serve and connect with orchestras uh, from tiny to enormous uh, in every Canadian province. My particular work has focused on advocacy at the provincial and federal levels, but I am absolutely aware of the of the foundational role that uh, municipal and regional arts support plays in helping emerging groups get going, uh, helps to support a, a healthy infrastructure. So when the folks at Spark asked me to uh, lead this session, I immediately thought that I wanted to partner up with Sue uh, because of what I've seen her do in Peterborough and the kind of grace and strong, strong uh, connections to community that she manages to uh, foster. Uh, she's a graceful and articulate exponent for the arts, and, uh, okay, I'm going to stop it now. I will stop <laughs> praising Sue, but I will simply say that uh, I think between us, it's a pretty complimentary skill set. package. Plus, we both have silver hair, mm -hmm. kind of messy today, and big glasses. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's what you're getting. Uh, so Can somebody put smiley faces in the comments? Can anyone hear us? That's that's the other question. Yeah. Uh, drop us a line and let us know if you can actually uh, uh, hear us. We think this is working, but we're not absolutely certain. Okay, so I want to give you, first of all, now that we've uh, done the, the intros, a bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about today. We'll be um, trading uh, mm -hmm. back and forth our, our different topic areas. 
Uh, but here's here's the overview. Oh, excellent! Thank you so much for confirming that uh, that oh, we can be heard. Now stop rattling your papers, Sue. Uh, so. The first uh, section that we'll be handling is creating the conditions for advocating. What preparatory steps do you need to take? And Sue will be leading you through uh, some of the work that the Electric City Culture Council has done in making sure that they were well set up uh, to take the lead on advocacy. The next thing we're going to cover is some relatively simple steps that even the most time-strapped, uh, people-strapped uh, organizations or individuals can take to um, develop relationships uh, and just start the, the lines of communication uh, with elected officials and bureaucrats that you would be dealing with at any government level. Next, we'll be moving on to, uh, I think, the, a really fundamental thing and something that I believe in super strongly is the importance of a united front. And Sue will be talking mm -hmm. about some of the steps uh, that she recommends in building that united front and frankly, I may be stepping on her toes a little bit and saying a few things that I've learned about that as well. Next, we'll be talking about relationship development, who and how. And again, I'll take the lead on that one. Sue will be uh, adding her valuable knowledge to that one. Uh, we'll also be talking about casting the roles. And I think that that's a really uh, important thing. I, I, I call it casting because I think that's something that has real resonance in the performing arts community. Uh, the right people uh, in, in the right positions at the right time. Um, absolutely fundamental, something we understand, something we should be thinking about for advocacy as well. Next, some thoughts on language. And I'll be taking the lead on that one because I think there's a few ways of thinking about this work and expressing this work that will ensure that you are better heard. We'll then move on to some advocacy resources. Uh, if you take a look at the About This Talk uh, section, I've put together a Google Doc uh, with a number of things that I've turned up uh, over uh, the last number of years and a few things that are uh, brand spanking new and uh, happy to share those and happy to expand that list. And then uh, we'll be dealing with questions uh, if anything pops up in the, uh, in, in the comment boxes. And then uh, signing off and moving on uh, to the rest of our days, happily advocating on behalf of the arts. So Sue, I think it's now time for you to be talking about creating the conditions to advocate. What prep steps should an artist or an organization take? So a couple of things I wanted to start out with, but just to be clear that in my context, what I'm gonna talk about today is really at the local level. So based on my discussions with people at Spark um, over the last maybe year on and off, thinking about people that are living in smaller cities who may be representing regional groups or these somewhat faux cities created by the Mike Harris government, um, such as the city of Kawartha Lakes. Um, so what I'm thinking about you folks working with either local city councils or with regional government. Um, and what some of the particular challenges of those things are and how you can work with them. There's many advantages because it's so much easier to get connected and be involved. So I always say that successful arts advocacy relies on a couple of things. You need to know yourself, the community you're representing and what its needs are, and you need to know your target. Are you targeting a city council? Are you targeting regional government? Who do you need to talk to to get what you want? So you have to be really clear who you need to talk to, and then you have to create a body that's gonna to talk to them. Because being united and being able to speak in one voice is, I don't know why my eyes are going over there, but are really critical, is really critical to your success. So I, I, I thought a lot about, um, how that can happen because not every city or every region by any means has an arts council or an arts culture and heritage council but you can make it whatever you want it to be whether there is one that's been already officially kind of anointed by your municipality or your region if there isn't one create one you can create something and call it an arts council if you want it to become a nonprofit corporation it's now really easy to do that 
online. It costs, what, 50 bucks now, something like that? <laughs> yeah, and you only need three people. It's quite simple. Or you can create a coalition, or you can create an Arts for Caledon um, committee. And I'll say that I'm a big fan of experimenting with informal collaborations before taking the big not-for-profit step. But the point is, pull it together. Uh, you're not just asking for things that will change your organization's fate. You're looking at things that will ideally have an impact on more than just your organization or your own individual arts practice. Who else? is interested in the same issues as you are, who else will be positively affected by the change that you're looking to, to achieve? Okay. Well, that may seem challenging. I think the broader um, the landscape you have in your organization and the deeper the bucket, the better. It's not that hard. Most people who are involved in cultural organizations or heritage organizations are arts positive. And for all of us, I think, um, you know, who, and unless there's maybe people in really big cities, working across disciplines and working across professional arts organizations, amateur arts organizations, paraprofessional arts organizations is really crucial. Um, we all have the same faith and belief in the importance of the arts to a healthy and vital community and society at a million levels, whether it's, you know, great living conditions, things to do, economic impact, creativity, spiritual impact, social development, all of those areas, cultural organizations, heritage arts organizations, and arts organizations will have a commitment. Because if you can go forward and say, we're a group of 15 organizations, we represent 500 members and 10,000 people in our audiences, that has a really big impact. Um, people who are in decision-making roles and who can make financial decisions and program decisions and policy decisions that will affect you positively listen to numbers. Okay, so that's the idea of, of working in collaboration, Sue. What are some of the other steps that someone, let's say, who's involved with an arts organization might want to take to make sure that when they step out, on this this narrow rail uh, of our arts advocacy that they have the mandate from their organization to do so and that they understand something around uh, what is acceptable advocacy and what we might be looking a little bit uh, say um, far out right. there yeah <laughs> um, a, a few things that I wanted to talk about one is that you really need to know and understand where um, the politics and the policies and the programs currently are. So before you start to develop an advocacy agenda, make sure you're really clear if you're saying we want more financial support for arts organizations, then you need to be really clear about what financial support exists. Because there may be a direct grant program, it may be indirect, there may be property tax rebates for charitable organizations. Make sure you know where things stand work together as a group to develop a three to five year, well, I would say actually a four year plan of what your priorities are and when you're gonna go after them. And why did I say four years? It's because that's the cycle of municipal elections. And you have to get it clear in your head how that cycle works, when, when are budget discussions gonna happen at your city hall or at your re regional, um, center and and be planning your initiatives in close relationship to that and then you have to work hard together to narrow down your priority and your asks because you'll start out with a brainstorming session and people will be asking for millions of dollars and 10 or 12 initiatives and you have to come together as a group and say we know we're not going to get 10 or 12 and we know we're not going to get 50 million but we think we might get this. And you have to be really articulate and have an agenda in place. And then if you formed a coalition, if you have an arts council, the first thing EC3 did was their, our board brainstormed. We did some consultations in the broader community to make sure we were on track. We did research and we broke it down into agenda for this upcoming, the election that just passed, in fact, to eight critical issues that we wanted city council to be addressing over the next four years. 
And it's really important that you can go forward to the public, to other people in the arts, culture, and heritage community, and to the decision makers with a really tight, clearly articulated agenda with clear priorities. I want to leap in here briefly and say a little bit about some law that is in the process of changing. Mm -hmm. If your arts organization is also a registered charity, you'll know that when you fill out your T3010 form every year and file it with uh, the Canada Revenue Agency, you have to talk about uh, your political activities. The definition of and, and the percentage of your revenues that you have expended on political activities. Now, uh, there's been a, a little bit of back and forth in recent years about what is acceptable political activity and what is not. Uh, the major thing I, I would uh, urge you to consider, even as the law changes, is well, two things really. First one is, it is absolutely a fundamental tenet of the current government's approach that charities are an important part of the public policy process. Mm -hmm. And that the things that charities know and have experienced and have done research on and can directly attest to should be heard by government uh, and, and should be heard in uh, appropriate formal and informal processes. So that is understood. The second thing, however, is that anything that smacks of partisan activity of uh, saying really party oriented, yeah, voting for this candidate versus this candidate, uh, you know, buying a dinner to a, a fundraising initiative for a candidate for for office and using organizational resources to do that. Uh, those things are essentially giant no nos, uh, and you will want to consider uh, not embarking on things that could at all be defined as as partisan. I'll slap up a link later on this page to the current interpretation on the Canada Revenue mm -hmm. uh, Agency website. But just to say, getting politically involved and presenting fact-based positions to uh, candidates at all levels is entirely inappropriate. It is an appropriate, not an inappropriate, but an appropriate thing for a registered charity to do. You are not putting your charitable status at risk. And the uh, it seems to me that the exemption on spending more than 10% of your revenues, oh, that would be a fabulous thing, on uh, political activity will soon be lifted. But in the meantime, we know that we're all operating on uh, approximately five cents per year uh, to, to allocate towards this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, you are, uh, by and large, free and clear to do that, but stay away from anything that smells of, uh, of partisan activity uh, is, is the one piece of counsel. But you do have a role to play in this dialogue, and it's important to consider how you can most effectively engage. I think uh, for EC3, uh, just during the recent election, what we did around that was we sent um, letters to all of the candidates, um, both uh, ward candidates and to the mayoral candidates. We invited them to, we, we do what we call arts vote events for both the federal, municipal, and uh, provincial elections. And for the municipal elections, we did round table speed dating discussions on, on the eight topics that we had identified as our advocacy agenda. And you can definitely do that. You can invite, invite audiences. You can, we had table leaders that talked with all the candidates. You can write down what they say. You can publish what they say. You can broadcast what they say. What you can't do is say, vote for this one or vote for that one. But you can encourage anyone you're talking to on social media. We do a radio show to just get out and vote, to listen to what the candidates had to say about your topics and to get out and vote. So one other thing on that, if you don't have the local infrastructure to put together an arts specific, uh, all candidates mm -hmm. gathering, uh, see what you can do to get arts questions onto other people's all candidates uh, gatherings. That's a, a perfectly viable thing to do and uh, quite often uh, event organizers are keen uh, mm -hmm. to, to have you do that and uh, to know that that's part of a rich round discussion. It also ensures that more than just the usual suspects uh, are hearing the candidates' responses. Um, I know here in Peterborough, this is a community that loves its arts and, and culture. Um, it, it really does. They don't always have the clearest understanding of the conditions that enable a strong arts and culture mm -hmm. community. Uh, but by goodness, uh, 
they're there for the arts community by and large. But to make that interesting connection between this lively, vital thing that makes our lives joyful mm -hmm. uh, and provokes us and, and gets us thinking and, and helps connect us better to one another, to make the connection between those good things that we all agree are good and really superlative public policy and visionary funding. Uh, I think is an important thing to do, and I think it's it's a service to our fellow citizens and our, our fellow voters to be able to clarify the connection between the things we love and the things that help keep them lively and vital. May I suggest you check out a couple of things as you're building your advocacy agenda, because right right now it's not, you know, in order to aid um, an election, it's your councils will all be meeting and all be starting to work on their four year plans so you need to understand not a lot of budget stuff will happen in 2019 because most or people's budgets are set there will be very little wiggle room but 2020 2023 are really really crucial years to be trying to advocate for change and just to look to compare and contrast you could take a look at ec3's website and what we put up for arts vote peterborough but also take a look at the city of kawartha lakes website and what they put up for their arts vote event, because you can really see how important it is to tailor, tailor your agenda and your language to exactly where your community is. So they were asking for things like having an arts officer on council, uh, in city staff, rather than money coming to them first, they would just like there to be a staff person to, to manage arts, culture, and heritage things. Um, they don't have a municipal cultural plan, and that's a little bit different from, from where we are in Peterborough. So take a look at those two and figure out where or, what your organization is. Don't be shy. Brand what you're doing. Create an identity for your organization. Um, you could even bring it together as a leadership caucus. If, if you're in a, a widespread area and there's only a few organizations and you, you can't really have a coalition, just pull the chair of a board or the senior person or the main volunteer. You don't have to have a you know, multi-layered, dense structure of professional arts organizations to make it work, but do brand it. If it's, you know, if it's gonna be the BALA, or Huntsville Arts Coalition, call it that and give it a brand. Now I'm going to ask you, is this going okay for folks? Is, can you hear us and is everything fine? Are there really two? only two of you? Oh, there's four. Oh, there are four. That's right. Who's four. hiding? Uh, don't know, uh, can't say, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll roll this down and see uh, if we've got uh, some other action oh. here. Oh my goodness. A new comment. Oh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Good. Okay. Wonderful. We will. Uh, we, yes. So far, so good. So I'm going to roll on now and uh, move on to the starting simple thing. Uh, we now all have new municipal councils. We have relatively new members of provincial parliament. And goodness knows our members of parliament federally are starting to spend more time in the ridings as we uh, move, we're within a year of the federal election. So what are some ways in which a time strapped, cash strapped, uh, generally strapped arts organization or uh, individual with a strong arts practice uh, can get engaged uh, as, as easily as possible. One of the things that I've found, I don't know if you love Twitter, I'm addicted to it, it's, it's a very unfortunate characteristic here, but if you uh, can clear the headspace uh, and are willing, I warmly recommend uh, engaging with all of your elected officials on Twitter. Start following them. Just see who posts regularly, who's sending out things that you can engage with. Uh, Twitter in particular seems to be used by senior policy folks uh, mm -hmm. federally and, and provincially. Facebook seems to be a little friendlier for um, people at, at local levels. Mm -hmm. But I'm following all of my elected officials on both Facebook and Twitter. And you know, if there's something that I want them to know or a question I want to put to them, uh, I'll use that medium if it's a quick back and forth that I'm, I'm looking to do. So, as I say, uh, add it to your social media uh, as, as long as your, your mental health can stand it. And, uh, you know, just consider that as a, another informal strategy for keeping abreast of where they've been, where they're going, what they're thinking, what they've last said at a meeting. 
uh, and keep an eye on who they're meeting with as well. Uh, it's, it's a bit creepy, um, but I think very effective. Second thing is, what are you already communicating to your audience? Uh, what strategies are, are you already using to get news out to uh, uh, your, uh, your followers? Are you, do you do a, a, a regular email newsletter? Are you putting hard copy materials in the mail? Um, this is the time. Uh, to add elected officials, whether new or or, or continuing, uh, to your mailing list. Just make sure that they've got that uh, regular form of contact. Uh, one sort of note on email communications. Although the Canada anti-spam legislation is important and you should be thinking about it, the fact is these are elected officials. They have published their contact information on their websites. Therefore, it is fair game for you to add them to your mailing list so here. Them an unsubscribe option. That's right. And as long as you've got a, a robust unsubscribe option, uh, one click or, or thereabouts, uh, there's no difficulty with doing this. And frankly, it's it's a really easy way to make sure that they have uh, a, a bit of a clue as to what's going on. Something else that we've talked about a little bit, Sue and I have had a, a bit of exchange about this one, is you know, do you in, do you offer them free tickets to an upcoming event or an, a show opening or something along those lines? I'm not a giant fan of, of free tickets uh, because I think it gives a funny message in terms of, uh, you know, arts are free. Uh, no, those tickets have a value to them and I'd urge you to consider a different way of uh, getting elected officials to an upcoming uh, event uh, that, that you or your organization are putting on. And what Sue and I ultimately um, uh, decided was a, a robust thing to recommend to you uh, was the idea of offering to host uh, the elected official. Take them on a date. Yep. Uh, find someone on your board, find someone, uh, one of your, your supporters, who's able to be a host uh, for an elected official at one of your events. The nice thing is, you know, it, it, it makes sure that there's an opportunity to give some of the key messages, perhaps, during the, during the conversation. But there's also an opportunity for a very human connection between someone from your organization and the elected official, just to have a little bit of a chat about how it's going, what's on their minds, what they what what their impressions are of uh, the artistic experience that they're having at the event, and also uh, to monitor their reactions to who else is in the audience. Is the elected official seeing a side of your community that they're less familiar with mm -hmm. in terms of who's in the audience or who's on stage? What does that mean? What what kinds of opportunities does that potentially open up? So this idea of hosting, not just you know throwing a, a bale of free tickets out there, but uh, you know indeed setting people up on on a bit of a date uh, with a host from your organization can be an immensely effective strategy. And uh, so just just to throw that one out there as, as a bit of a concept. It is, of course, important to consider scheduling pretty carefully, um, particularly for the MPPs and the MPs. They are out of town so much that their time back in the riding tends to be quite precious. I would urge you uh, on the uh, Google Doc that I linked at the at the top of our little event description, and I'll, I'll refer to a little bit later as well. We do have the uh, schedules for the House of Commons and for the provincial legislature at Queen's Park. And that will give you a sense of when your MPP or MP is likely to be in Ottawa or likely to be in Toronto and give you a sense too of when they're a little bit more likely to be in the riding. So probably better not to invite them when <laughs> they're in the middle of a, a, a session at the House of Commons, but uh, consider your schedule and theirs and, uh, and get that to, uh, uh, you know, sort of think about this one strategically and uh, and consider um, how that might work. Something else I've been told that I think is pretty pretty fun. If you're doing something that involves school kids, if there's uh, an education program mm -hmm. that that your organization is leading or that you as a, as an artist are are hosting, um, the photo op that is a, a a heartwarming and wonderful photo op is something to consider staging. Let's face it, they're running for office the moment they were last elected. The opportunity to be uh, seen to be engaged in something that is wonderful and positive and is changing the lives of people in the community around them. Um, if you can help organize that, that's a fantastic thing. So consider, too, the, 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 the photo op. And that yeah. sounds a bit cynical. We, we've been usurped by children um, when we were advocating at city council. So we now realize the key is 
to take the kids with us. Um, create an op a photo op opportunity for us with kids. Anyway. Um, just in case your elected officials aren't, you know, sort of wild for gray haired women with big glasses, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of uh, cogitate around this one. But, you know, it, it can be made to work. And it's, it's one of those things where you're telling more of the story of your work in the community. If you're engaging uh, a broad demographic of people as uh, recipients of, of, the, of the work that you're doing or participants in the work that you're doing. Kathleen's words lead me to say something else. And it's about it's leading into the language that we, we speak with. But those of us who are passionate of, for the arts tend to be purists. And I think when you're an advocate, you have to leave your purity hat behind a little bit. You have to really think hard and study and learn where your council members are at, where your mayor is at, and frame support for the arts in the way that they can hear it. That may be more an economic argument. It may be more an audience argument. It may be more um, how artists are interacting with seniors. That's okay. We've got to get them on board. We've got to get them to know us, see our faces, enjoy talking to us and then we can take them into the deeper things in terms of supporting professional arts and professional arts organizations. Just wanted to link the question of knowing and understanding people's schedules to the local level. It's important that you talk to your city clerk and you understand what the schedule of council meetings and committee of the whole meetings are. You want to talk to your city clerk and make sure that you're on certain people's email lists like the planning department, if there's a community service department, um, whoever at City Hall is gonna be touching on the areas that you care about, make sure you're on their mailing list because I'm finding in Peterborough, the communications techniques are still pretty old school. They publish a notice in the newspaper. So if you're, you should be reading your local newspaper every day, but if heaven help you if you lose that, don't or miss that one notice. Then in terms of preparing your ground, I don't know if this is preparing your ground so much as, as it is infiltrate. So find out, and now is the moment to do it because appointments are being made to municipal committees. Find If there is a committee that advises on parks and recreation, if recreation is the area that arts falls under in, in your community, if there's a separate thing for arts, culture, and heritage, Find out when the call is going to go out for community members to join those committees and get your crowd, as I like to say, it's the influence of Edith Goodrich from Newfoundland, um, get your crowd to try and put their names forward and get on the committees. So the closer you can get to City Hall, the more you can keep sending the same message and the more different people. You don't always want the same people sending the message. You can get out there sending the messages over and over and over again. And the more points of contact City Hall staff and city councillors have with the people in your community, the better off you'll be. Okay, I think our next heading, uh, we've, we've touched on the topic already a, a little bit, but I, I wanna go back to it and make sure that we've uh, really uh, said all we want to say on this, getting it together, the power of United Front. And is there, Sue's talked a bit about working in coalition, uh, whether it's a for, under the auspices of a formal organization or whether it is a, a temporary coalition that's come together uh, for one or more specific uh, approaches. Is there anything else we'd like to say about the value of that over any other uh, approach? Well, I, I think the one thing I would say is even by bringing people together, you start to build leadership skills. So one of the things EC3 started to do it was when the city was going to do something called Vision 2025, which was its, um, called, it was its leisure and recreation plan. And it did have some arts components to it. So we brought what we decided, and we decided it, who's the lead, who are the leaders of the arts community in Peterborough? And there were about 17 or 18 people. And we brought them together for the first time. And a whole bunch of wonderful things came out of that. First of all, they'd never come together before. And we've had a robust arts community here for at least 40 or 50 years. 
it was remarkable how easy it was to come to consensus on what the priorities were and how willing people were to go out to these consultations the city was holding for their Vision 2025 plan. What's really um, important, I think, is that you keep the spectrum broad um, and be really open, as I said before, to all disciplines, to all cultural organizations, include heritage groups if you can, because you know there's all kinds of crossovers between heritage and gentrification issues and and arts issues um, keep your you know just your basic demographics if you can mix age gender sexual orientation cultural diversity indigenous backgrounds all of the things that you would be thinking about in building a board do that in your leadership caucus put forward that really mixed face and um, Try and think about, you get to know people that way, who might be best, who might be the best voice, that's going to take us into casting, who might be the best voice on certain issues or when speaking to certain people. There's a couple of other things I'd like to throw in about the uh, working in coalition. Uh, this next piece of advice comes courtesy of Robert Lynch, who is the CEO of Americans for the Arts, an absolutely monumentally uh, effective arts advocacy organization based in the US and Bob Lynch talking about uh, working in coalition of course the really annoying thing about working in coalition that we're not saying out loud right now is it's so many people and it's so many perspectives on what needs to happen and what needs to happen now that it, it can become very difficult to build a, a common voice but it is essential to build a common voice I think we just got cut off but we're back again uh, hopefully you can uh, you can We'll get you back again and uh, so forth. Okay, so my uh, thinking on uh, building Lynch. on Bob Lynch is basically we're only going to go forward with the things that we can all agree on. We, we're, back we're, back, we're back now. We're, we're back. Okay, thank you for uh, rejoining us, uh, Rebecca. Uh, we lost, uh, we went, uh, we were live and then we, we Facebook cut us off. Um, so we're, thank you very much for rejoining us, uh, Millie and Rebecca, and I think we'll be uh, gathering a few more people as we go. Apologies for that. I really don't know what just happened, but we're back. Okay, but just to say, if you're working uh, to build common cause, only go forward with the things that you agree on. There are some things that you will never agree on as a group, so come up with a list of things that you will agree on and go forward with that. There's probably plenty of rich stuff right there. Keep it simple and away we go. So that's one thing. Second thing I'll say about uh, working in coalition is it is actually a courtesy to elected officials and to the bureaucracy that there's a group of people who clearly done their homework in advance have come together with a uh, common cause. The thing I've heard more often than anything else is uh, when I've endeavored to uh, freelance and or freestyle and go in on my own is, why do you people not get your act together? Why don't you come together as a united group? It's a lot easier for us to say yes if we know that you've done the work in advance. So it is a, a legitimate courtesy to people making important decisions that we do our homework and, and come together on the things that we can agree on. People love to say that trying to hear what artists think or understand what they mean is like herding cats, which is so insulting. I always want to roll my eyes and say, well, you mean harder than keeping city council on track and speaking with one voice? But really, as an advocate, and that's what I was saying, get knock it down to five things have a leadership caucus, brainstorm there, your own board or the core of your coalition, brainstorm there. You can do a survey monkey survey out to your community. Um, you can have focus groups. There's many, many ways you can pull those priorities together and then go forward with those and everybody, um, you know, the true meaning of working by consensus is that you, you try to come up with this core group of things that you agree on and then the other things you agree not to stand in the way of so that your your organization or your community can can move forward together yeah. we're now going to talk about relationship building uh, who and how we've talked a lot about uh, elected officials but i cannot cannot emphasize strongly enough the importance of working effectively uh, with staff 
and whether it is staff in the elected officials office if they're lucky enough to have staff or whether it is uh, the independent bureaucracy at city hall at regional council at uh, at the legislature or at a ministry staff uh, or at, at the federal level, that it is really, really important uh, to cultivate relationships at all levels. In some cases, staff will in fact hold the key uh, to being able to get things done. They'll have a very clear sense of the legislative and budget agenda. They'll know when things are happening. If they know you, they like you, and they trust you, they will be your very best friend. So don't uh, assume that having an awesome meeting with your MP is at all meaningful if you've somehow succeeded in extremely annoying uh, somebody uh, who's actually responsible for getting uh, the work done at the end of the day. A couple of pieces of advice on that one. Um, if you and colleagues have uh, gone in for a meeting with someone, this is a little bit funny, but uh, uh, don't do a review of the meeting until you are thoroughly outside the building. <laughs> Um, if the meeting was good, that's wonderful. You can be thankful, uh, you know, to all who are involved in helping to set that meeting up. Uh, but make sure that you get outside the building before you do a happy dance. Uh, even more important, if the meeting was uh, uh, subpar, shall we say, don't talk about it in the hallway. Don't talk about it in the elevator. Don't talk about it on the steps of the building. Make sure that you are thoroughly clear of the building that you are in because you simply don't know who can overhear what you're saying and what's going to drift back to the person that you're attempting to craft a relationship with. So every contact that you have is an important one, whether it's you're talking with a, someone who's helping the scheduling of a meeting, uh, whether you're talking to the receptionist in the office, whether you're talking to uh, the legislative assistant, whoever it is, that person is important and could be very uh, key to you having success in what it is that you're doing. Um, every relationship in this kind of work is important and you just never know where someone's going to wind up next. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, good advocates don't, uh, don't, don't stop off against each other. Yeah, and, and, and don't differentiate uh, that. In terms of the how, um, uh, another non literary reference, I suppose, uh, there was a wonderful film called The Fog of War by the filmmaker Errol Morris. Uh, it's uh, an, an extended interview with Robert McNamara, who was the Oh, God, I guess the, the Secretary of Defense, uh, working with Kennedy and, and then with Johnson. And they're talking about the failure of the U.S. policy in Vietnam. And McNamara has uh, boiled down 10 important lessons. I'll get to the point of this eventually, I promise you. Lesson number one, the very most important thing that McNamara learned from the failure of U.S. policy was empathize with the enemy. If you do not know what the MP is, is thinking about or working on, if you don't understand the breadth of what your MPP has on their plate, if you are not somewhat cognizant of what's going on at City Council and the, and the complexity of the decisions that are being made there, um, give your head a shake and take a moment to use your, um, your emotional intelligence mm -hmm. to empathize with the, the severe demands that these folks are under. Um, I realize, you know, sure, they, they, they ran for office. They knew what they were um, in for. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But as people active in the arts community, as artists, as arts supporters, as arts workers, um, one of the things that characterizes us is our empathy and our imaginations and our ability to sort of occupy someone else's mind space, at least briefly. It is hugely important uh, to go into a meeting, however harsh the thing you're asking for might feel, but to, to help to contextualize that within the range of other demands that the person you're meeting with might have on their plate. And to be thinking about that and to, to be um, sensitive in the way that you put things forward. And, you know, some of the loudest uh, laughs I've ever had have been in meetings with elected officials because uh, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're charismatic, community minded individuals and uh, quite often are, are possessed of a wicked wit. I don't call a meeting where there's been laughter uh, a bad meeting. 
I know that I can go back and we can continue a conversation if we've had a really awesome rockin' time in mm -hmm. that conversation. So, you know, be yourself uh, and enjoy yourself in that conversation. Put yourself in their shoes. Think about what that's like. And you'll have a far better meeting than if you go in with a, a 10 point list of non negotiable demands. Sort of like that Barbara Colorosa parenting advice about playing a lot with your children and building a relationship through play so that then discipline becomes much easier and is more successful at a lower level. Because you may have to discipline your counselors from time to time. I'm just kidding. But. Um, <laughs> You really have to focus on building the relationship face to face. I always do things first over the telephone and follow up with an email. Um, You're very old timey too. Yeah, I know. I but think you're supposed to be liking someone's pictures on Instagram. Oh God! <laughs> just as long as okay. it's not certain people's photographs. But anyway, um, just keep keep me focused here. Okay. Um, but just can I? I'm just gonna follow it one. So. It is really important to build that personal relationship, to be sympathetic to what challenges both the counselors and the staff face. Be very careful that not, do not get sucked into um, dissing staff in front of counselors or dissing counselors in front. Again, uh, Sue has suggested that we're actually being um, wiretapped by Peterborough City Council and uh, its its staff, but uh, we'll uh, we'll simply say uh, right. No be bad. Respectful. Be respectful. No bad mouthing. Um, next one we're going to talk about a little bit is casting the roles. And again, this is something where um, we in the arts community have a pretty significant. Uh, advantage in terms of understanding the importance of the right person at the right time. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say a little bit about that, Sue? Um, again, while you're going to speak with one voice in terms of the things that you're looking for, the changes that you want, um, shifts that you want, new th initiatives that you want, um, that doesn't all have to come from the same person all the time. And in fact, there may be certain people that are, are better doing certain things. So. Um, we sometimes ask a really strong actor that we work with and a woman who's on our board. Sometimes we write the text for her, sometimes we don't. But she's such a great presenter, we ask her to present. And because it's so close to her heart, I think she speaks with a, with a passion that really gets through to even the most resistant counselor. If your counsel tends to listen to a certain kind of voice, i.e. white men over the age of 50 in business suits and you can find someone to say part of your talk to, in, to them, go for that person. If you've um, really been able to, to build a terrific relationship with um, one counselor, see if you can get that counselor to take the lead on the discussion with the other counselors. So think about who will do the best job of, of presenting your case. Um, it doesn't always have to be the same person. And you can also go in pairs. So Catherine and I um, worked together. She was supporting um, the Peterborough Symphony Orchestra, and we worked with them in an appeal to get a big increase in the grant budget for the operating grants. They're called community investment grants here, but for the operating grants to arts organizations. And I got to work with a wonderful man, Blair McKenzie, who's a lawyer, and who spoke, he spoke to very specific things, and I spoke to other things, and it was great teamwork, and we worked it all out in advance. And it was a beautiful thing to see both the uh, harvesting of the relationships that Sue had built over a period of many years of uh, stalwart service to the arts and, and to watch the discernible impact when she spoke, as well as the discernible impact when Blair presented his perspectives on arts funding. So it was a, kind of a neat thing to see that, that, that one-two punch, and I think that that can be tremendously effective. I'm now going to roll on uh, quickly to a conversation around language. And there's a couple of things that I, I want to throw out to you for your consideration. There's a lot more to be said here, uh, but uh, a, a few things to ponder. One of the most effective forms of uh, policy development that uh, advocates can play is in helping decision makers solve the problems that they've already identified. In what way is the thing that we are putting forward a solution to a problem that has been identified 
um, but the solutions are eluding uh, political decision makers. Can we put forward the things we're looking for as solutions to problems that they've identified? Something that's connected to that in terms of, of, of pitching the case is a question around how we talk about the arts and the role in the community and the, and the condition of artists and arts workers in the community. Are we seeing this as something, um, are we presenting our needs or are we presenting our contribution? And over, it's, I find incredibly difficult uh, to get our heads out of the needs mm -hmm. uh, mind space because we need so much. We need money, we need time, we need resources, we need facilities, we need, all of those things are absolutely true, but I think we have the, have the best chance of making those uh, needs understood and acted on if we present these as opportunities to increase the impact that we are having. And that idea of contributing to community, I think is, is a very potent one. And the idea of linking what we are asking for to a heightened opportunity to contribute to our community to solve those problems in, in ways that hadn't perhaps previously been considered, I think is, is fantastic. So urge you to think about that one. It, it's really crucial. I, I think I have here somewhere, don't make it just about us. So my first extension to that is always to talk about audiences that anything that's done to help individual artists or help arts organizations is really helping all the audiences because we might be able to lower ticket prices, we might be able to do more events at different times, welcome young people, welcome seniors. We're doing just a ton of work right now uh, with persons with disabilities, um, with new Canadians. Um, so it's not just about us because a lot of people will <laughs> <laughs> position um, position any ask as spoiled, selfish, elitist, entitled artists wanting more. So we really got to move that conversation out of that framework. Um, to value yeah. you think. Totally agree. Thanks, Millie. Um, th that, that's really key, and it's not that hard to do. Another way that you can show that the arts aren't just about themselves is to get involved in some civic wide things. So this is a small thing but our city gives civic awards every year and I realized at a certain point that the arts community thought they were kind of, I don't know what they thought, that they were tacky or old-fashioned or something and they recognized volunteers. So over the last three years we've put a big push on nominating artists, they have to be for their volunteer work and so many artists volunteer in the community in, in a million ways on on boards by donating their work by doing benefit concerts any opportunity you have to put the arts community individual artists board members leaders volunteers in front of city council do it take the time do the work it's lovely for the person who wins the award you want opportunities to shake hands, to say, oh, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Gee, you know that big fair that we put on this summer was a huge success. You've got to get your face in front of them all the time and show that you're participating in ways that they understand. Okay, so uh, we're, there's more to say. One last little precision on language. And this is a gift from a man named Peter Power who ran the Atlantic Federation of Musicians in Halifax for many, many years. And uh, Peter taught me that you never talk about grants, you never talk about handouts, you always talk about investments. And, I, you know, it, it's corporate speak, it's neoliberal, it's something or other, but it's also a reminder that it is not money for nothing. It is a small portion of what it takes for a, a, a performing arts organization to, to flourish, but it is a uh, helpful investment and governments invest in all kinds of things at all times uh, this is an arts investment so you know forgive me for uh, using corporate speak but I think it's an important 
uh, use of language that reminds people that it's not a handout. It is an investment. It helps good stuff happen. Uh, for the last formal part of our uh, session today, I simply wanted to draw your attention to something that has disappeared from my screen, uh, but I will slap up once this is done, and that is uh, a link to a Google Doc uh, that fun. Sue and I put together of arts advocacy resources. Uh, and this is all uh, material that is freely available on the web, uh, some things that are useful at all levels, uh, so links to Hill Strategies, uh, wonderful arts research, links to the Americans for the Arts, Arts and Social Impact Explorer, which is a brand new and, and fabulous tool. If you're looking for information on arts and aging, arts and uh, people with disabilities, arts and education, arts and newcomer integration, arts and so, it's, it's anyway, it freaks me out, it's all there. Um, superb guide to ABC's arts advocacy from the uh, Canadian Conference of the Arts and a fine uh, updated guide to municipal and provincial arts advocacy from the Ontario Association of Art Galleries and on down. There's some specific municipal links, some specific provincial links, and I want to do a shout out to Ontarians for the Arts, a new mm -hmm. inclusive nonpartisan arts movement uh, that will be, I think, very important for everyone in the arts community over the coming months as we work to create new relationships with the government of Ontario. Uh, and some federal uh, material as well, including links to the website of the Canadian Arts Coalition, uh, nonpartisan arts movement that's been doing amazing work at the federal level for, gosh, I think since 2005. Mm -hmm. It was at its opening meeting. Uh, but a number of things there that I, I hope that you're actually uh, able to use. And again, uh, we're a little technically challenged right now. I think that link was uh, with our original live chat, but I'll make sure that it makes it up to the Spark. Uh, conversation uh, or the spark page before we uh, before too much more time passes once we close off now because we lost you and got you back and lost you and got you back I think we lost any of the questions that might have come up along the way we've got a few minutes uh, before we wrap at two o'clock uh, can I ask if you have any questions at this point and see if I can get you to move your elbow uh, we'll just see uh, feel free to include them in the chat box and we'll, we'll kind of do a it's like a Reddit ask me anything. This is your chance. We'll wait a moment and see if. Yes, you should dress up when you present to council. No, I'm just <laughs> pretending there's a question there. That's right. Try not to sound frustrated when you're talking to counselors or staff people. Always be diplomatic. Um, my worst one is rolling my eyes. Okay, so wear dark glasses uh, in order that eye rolling cannot be seen. I think the really important part uh, for me in, in, in the talking, we might get frustrated with our elected leaders, but we put them there. They are a reflection of us. And so it's, it's our job to uh, connect, relate, uh, and make them the best elected leaders that they can be, uh, and, and vice versa. Some of the most inspiring people I know uh, hold elected office, and it's it's exciting to see. So you're a performance artist, and you're talking to your city councillor, and he says, you know, my grandmother painted plates. You have to get really excited about the fact that his grandmother painted plates, and then try and link it to some painters in town, and if you have a public art gallery to that, if you have a, you know, we have the Kortha Artists Gallery and Studio here, which are our a group of painters and they, they do workshops and en plein air exercises and all kinds of, of great things and they have exhibitions of their work and jury shows link it link it to that see them as human beings and you want to win them over to your side okay I think we have no questions well we could ask the existential question why but I think we won't we know why this is a vital topic we're excited to be advocates for the arts um, I'm excited to see where these opportunities for empathetic, well-informed, collaborative, and consensus-driven uh, conversation uh, with our elected officials and with the, the staff that they work with can potentially go, and we need it more than ever. We're all in this boat. So what I'd like to do, I think, at this point is simply say that we will put up the link to the Google Sheet on the Spark page uh, shortly. Uh, we really value the opportunity to engage with the group today. We apologize for the uh, technical uh, pop-ups, uh, but 
Wow, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Millie, uh, for <laughs> sending along your, your positive thoughts. And thanks everyone for following us uh, through the Facebook Live, Facebook Dead, Facebook Live, Facebook Dead uh, um, technical experience today. Uh, it's been a giant thrill and a great honor. Uh, thanks so much, and you know where to find us. Yeah, I was going to say, don't look, look up the EC3 website. Don't hesitate to me. It's better to give me a call, 705-749-9101, if you want to hash something over. And I just want to say good luck. Congratulations. I'm so excited that you're taking on advocacy in your own communities. And hang in there. You'll, you'll get her done. Yep, we're here to support you. And you can find me. Email me, Catherine, K A T H E R I N E, at oc.ca. Um, I think Sue's a tad older than I am, so she likes to be phoned. I like to be emailed. I'm Italian. I like to talk. Okay. Anyway, thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. -bye.